I am ready to continue with chapter six of Annabelle, a ghostly Texas tale by me, Shauna Kiefer, copyright Old Barn Press. And this today's reading is from chapter six, Fists and Chainsaws. Um, I just heard of a friend of mine whose mom passed away. So today's reading is dedicated to the moms. Uh, my own mom is in the hospital today, so please pray for Glenda. And with that, let's get going, gather your kids around, and enjoy a, uh, a mommy kiddos moment, or just your family, or just yourself, just if you like being read to. So here we go, chapter six, Chiss and, <laughs> a little dyslexic, Fists and Chainsaws. Next morning, evidence of the storm was everywhere. The TV news carried footage of a mobile home community less than five miles away, completely wiped out by a strong twister. In their own backyard, Kate stared, horrified, at the huge pecan tree, roots plucked out of the ground like a giant weed, lying on its side a mere two feet from their back door. Part of the school had lost its roof, so the kids wouldn't be returning until the next week. Liam was the only one disappointed by this news. Rollins' mood improved immediately and Phoenix was happy to retreat to her room with a book. About 9 a.m., their power went out. Great. Now the kids wouldn't even have public television to distract from bickering. Within 20 minutes, Kate wordlessly handed Rollins the dog's leash and held open the front door. Good. It's better than being stuck with a whiny baby. He delivered the parting shot at Liam and slammed the door. Kate watched from the kitchen window as Rollins threw the leash into the weeds and stalked away. He couldn't have looked more miserable if he was being eaten alive by ants. He hardly said two words to her anymore, and when he did, it was to grumble about how there was, quote, nothing to do or other insults about Hicksville. Granted, they had zero internet or cell coverage, so even she felt off, cut off from civilization. But unplugging from computers was something she and Jansen had agreed needed to happen for many reasons. Unfortunately, until Rollins filled his time with other interests, Home felt like being caged with an angry bear. And when Kate asked about friends at school, Rollins just rolled his eyes. Rollins, at least try to find something in common, she had implored. Rollins had thought a moment, then responded, They hate me. I hate them. There. Happy? If only he could find a couple good friends. Immediately, Kate felt the bile rise in her throat. Friends. Her mind raced back a few years to a simple dinner scene with a dirty-faced, messy-haired 12-year-old Rollins. He'd sat at the dinner table shoving mashed potatoes into his already overflowing mouth as he rambled on about Dungeon Masters and his friend Nick's guidebook that revealed secrets about each level of the game and how they'd already reached level five. Apparently, none of the kids at school had done that, so it was a pretty big deal. What had been her concerns about him then? That he wasn't bathing enough? That he wanted to wear the same Dungeon Masters t-shirt for weeks on end? That he would become a computer geek like Nick? Ah, for those simple times. Soon after, Alex and his family moved in across the street and it was Alex this and Alex that and Rollins was always begging to go to Alex's house and fixing his hair like Alex and listening to different music. Suddenly, her son took showers without being reminded and was concerned about the label on his shoes and clothing. For a short time, Kate had been grateful for the changes in her son. He smelled better and dressed better. That was a good thing, right? Another scene came to mind. In hindsight, she saw red flags all over it. 13-year-old Rollins had raced into the kitchen. Mom, can I have 20 bucks? Why? Kate had licked the spaghetti sauce from her finger, thinking how she had 10 minutes to get everyone fed, had to locate Phoenix's missing shin guard for Taekwondo, and had to turn in the fundraising envelope with cookie order money she had sitting by her purse where she wouldn't forget it. Alex is getting a new game online for me. Honey, we've talked about this. No ordering stuff online without my supervision. But Rollins' voice went up in pitch and volume. He's already ordered it. Did you tell him to? Well, we talked about it, then he found this really good deal he couldn't pass up. He's, what, 13? How does Alex do this stuff? With his dad? Um, I guess, Rollins had hedged. So, can I have the money? I'll do chores or whatever. Kate had dismissed the desperation in Rollins' face. Everything was a huge deal at that age. Not now. We'll talk later. She had stepped away to yell up the stairs. Phoenix, did you find it? We're going to be late. Liam, Lily, let's eat. 
When she had turned back around, Rollins was gone. Later, when she was turning in the cookie earnings, she had discovered the envelope was $20 short. That moment had been the end of Kate's blissfully ignorant existence. She had worried about Alex's influence on Rollins, but how do you keep your son away from someone who goes to the same school and lives across the street and has serious enticements for a 13-year-old boy like unlimited computer access and tons of unsupervised time? She had met Alex's parents who were television producers and were always speaking into the phone devices attached to their ears. But she didn't know them well enough for a parenting conference. Besides, they were hardly ever there. So she had started inviting Alex to their house and having him join them for dinner and inviting him over on weekends. Then, she had reasoned, the boys were at least supervised. And she truly hoped they could have a good influence on Alex, who, according to Rollins, hardly ever saw his parents. But she couldn't keep up with them all the time. Lily and Liam required every ounce of energy, and Phoenix had soccer twice a week. Jansen's construction business had been in the midst of a new subdivision, and there was PTA and piano and dance lessons and, and, and. So Kate had done all she could and then worried to fill in the gaps, while her eager, talkative eldest son had become secretive, moody, and defiant. It's just teenage hormones, Jansen and well-meaning friends had assured her, and honestly, she had wanted to believe it. Kate snapped out of her unpleasant memories to realize she was gripping the edge of the sink so hard her knuckles were white. The blood was pounding in her ears and her jaw ached from clenching it. God, she wanted to hit something, kick something, grab a kid with expensive clothing and smack the smug grin off his face. She peeked at the kids. The power was back on, so cartoons babysat the younger two, and Phoenix had her nose in a book and in the room, so Kate snuck out the door. Though the sky was serene and cloudless, cloudless, the scars of the storm were everywhere with scattered limbs and trees whose leaves had been ripped away. Kate took a deep breath. The air smelled good, clean and earthy. With a sigh, she sat on the porch step and dropped her throbbing head into her hands. How she wanted to reach into her mind and tear out the torture of her memories, all the regrets, the horror her family had endured. A solid whack made her raise her head to the sunlight, eyes searching the bedraggled trees and leaf-strewn lawn as a flock of birds not far away twittered into the air. She walked toward the sound that seemed almost like an axe fall. Soon she could hear grunts of effort with each hit. Finally, she saw Rollins, tall, black-clad form through the trees, thick branch in hand as he pummeled the trunk of a large oak. When the branch broke, Rollins threw the pieces far and high, then resumed his assault on the tree trunk, kicking and punching with frightening intensity. Kate watched her son vent his rage, tears running down her cheeks as she shared his furious frustration. She understood only too well the need to beat the hell out of something or go berserk. And she didn't need to read her son's mind to know what cocky, fashionably coiffed face he was seeing in his rage. Alex's self-assured, charming grin was always in her mind and was a face she had beaten to a pulp in her own fantasies on many an occasion. But try as she might, she could never beat away the memories. Kate wiped an eye across her eyes and stood, ready to keep Rollins from breaking his hands, but a gentle pressure on her shoulder held her back. She turned in surprise to discover Cal. Let me handle this, okay? Kate was so stunned to find him there, so embarrassed to be crying in front of him, and so grateful for any help of any kind with Rollins that she nodded her head in mute agreement and ducked behind the nearest tree. As she watched Cal amble toward her son, she replayed the expressions she had seen in his eyes, the look that had brought a lump to her throat and made her want to bury her head against the shoulder of his jacket and weep away her fears. It was an expression she hungered for and had missed desperately, that concerned, fierce determination that had blazed, making his unshaven, angular jaw and lean, denim-clad form as breathtaking as any knight in shining armor. Now, what'd that tree ever do to you? Cal drawled as if commenting on the weather. He pulled out a pair of work gloves and slapped them against his knee, raising a cloud of dust. Rollins whipped around, just, just doing some... Uh, Karate. He wiped a self-conscious hand across his nose, unknowingly leaving a red streak in its wake. I can see that, but I don't think your ma is going to like what you've done to your hands. 
Rollins surveyed the ripped knuckles. Yeah, whatever. You won't be saying that tomorrow when they hurt like hell. Come on, we'll patch you up. How? Rollins looked dubious as he followed Cal's ambling stroll. Don't worry. Cal looked back at Rollins with a grin. I've had plenty of practice on horses. He chuckled as Rollins hesitated. Haven't lost a patient lately. As they moved off through the trees, Cal talked about nothing in particular, with Rollins a step behind, sweatshirt hood firmly in place. Kate breathed a sigh of relief. This was just what Rollins needed, some time with a man who could give him friendship and guidance, hopefully help him through the no-man's land between boy and adult. It should be his father, she grumbled as she headed back to their temporary home between the oak trees. Kate spied on them as she worked in the kitchen, noting when Cal washed her son's hands in the water from an outdoor spigot and added some sort of goo from a large jar he pulled out of the cab of his truck. Then came the wrapping of bandages and another set of work gloves and a chainsaw. She paced nervously in the kitchen, the protective mother warring with the sight of her that wanted her son to grow into a self-sufficient young man. Maybe she should have left him punching a tree. Better than accidental ampu amputation, right? Jansen had kept telling her to relax, to let their son grow up a bit. But the last time she had decided on non-interference, well, the familiar knot tightened in her stomach as those days of mounting fears about Rollins had kept her face pacing the floor by night until finally she had perused his email account. The next morning after a sleepless night, she and Jansen had confronted Rollins with the messages. Who's Bugle Boy? Jansen had asked. Rollins had looked up with a trapped expression. What? The one who sends you emails with the F word in every sentence? Kate's hands were shaking and there was an acidic taste in her mouth as she held the stack of papers toward her son. Rollins had flipped back the long strip of hair that fell strategically over one eye. Huh? She hadn't missed the fact her son's eyes were riveted to those papers as if they were a handful of poisonous snakes. Son, Jansen had interjected with a calm voice. There's links to porn sites here. Who is this person? Is it a kid from school? I, I'm not sure. Rollins had looked around at the walls of his room, down at his feet, anywhere but at their faces. I started getting them a while back. I usually just ignore them. Oh, come on, Rollins, your replies are right here. Kate had wished they weren't in her hand and she could believe her son was an innocent victim. Granted, his responses to Bugle Boy had not been so crude, but they existed. Did you see the one where I told him to stop sending that stuff? Don't I get credit for that? You should have blocked Bugle Boy the first time something like this came through, Jansen had replied. Ronson had <laughs> Rollins had shrugged and slumped in his chair. Jansen's tone had remained even. We told you the computer was in your room on trial. Trial's over. It's out. Use the one in the family room. But that's not fair! I can't help what someone sends me! It's not my fault. You can't take my computer. Your computer? Who pays for it? Kate had felt her own anger rise as Rollins had accused them of spying on him, of not trusting him. You think? Kate had said aloud to the hateful memories. Her stomach clenched as she recalled the downward spiral of their relationship with Rollins during those horrible months. It was the first time of many intervention attempts that had degenerated into a yelling match focused on Rollins' horrible attitude rather than the real issues. No matter what they did, how, how they tried to love, what privileges they took away, their son was drowning and there didn't seem to be a darn thing they could do to stop it. Laundry was interrupted by a knock at the back door so Kate aband abandoned her mountain of unmatched socks to view something truly frightening. There stood Cal and her 14-year-old son with chainsaws in hand. Just wanted to let you know Rollins has given me a hand Cal set down his own chainsaw on the ground as he put on his gloves. Might be a bit loud. Kate opened and shut her mouth, nonplussed that he wasn't asking her permission. She felt the panic rise in her eyes as she cast a glance toward the limb-severing beast in Rollins' hand. Um, well, he's never... I told you she wouldn't go for it, Rollins grumbled. Cal grinned. Ah, oh, relax, Mama Bear. I've been cutting wood since I was eight. I'll show him the ropes. He'll be fine. So Kate's protests were squelched before they were on her tongue. Next thing she knew, she had closed the door after a lame, be careful. 
She glanced through the window in time to see Cal slap her son on the back with a smug grin. Through the manufactured home's thin door, Cal's words came through loud and clear. Why'd I tell you? Piece of cake. Kate flushed with humiliation as she realized the cowboy had, once more, played her like a fiddle. But as Rollins' face spread into a conspiratorial grin, her mother's heart was reduced to a grateful puddle at Cal's dusty boots. It was six-year-old Raleigh, the happy boy she thought was only a memory, peeking out of sullen, teenaged eyes. She thought that boy was gone forever. So as the morning wore on, Kate went about her household duties in a haze of joy, even as she stole frequent glimpses of the chainsaw duo, bracing herself for the sight of blood. But noon rolled around without mishap, and as Cal and Rollins munched munch sandwiches on the porch steps, she slid up the kitchen window, unabashedly listening in on their conversation. So, you're not going to tell Mom I was beat up by a tree? I figure a kid's got to blow off steam every now and then. No big deal. Might as well accomplish something with it. Well, the yard sure looks better. We about done? Just getting started, city boy. Anyways, from what I saw between you and that tree, you got a lot of steam to blow. But that's a good thing if I'm going to hire you. Hire me? There's money to be made cutting and hauling wood. When winter, when winter comes, folks will pay good money for firewood, and I need help to be prepared. Money'd be cool, Rollins mumbled around a mouthful of sandwich. Well, nobody's going to hand it to you, Slick. Cal aimed a napkin at Rollins' head. Let's see what you're made of. Soon they had a large pile of logs cut to Cal's specific dimensions, the perfect size for a fireplace, stacked neatly beside the old house. But Cal was just getting started. While there was still daylight, chainsaws buzzed and branches fell as they cleared a wide swath around the manufactured home, then started on the jungle around Pettigo Manor, trimming monstrous shrubbery and branches that, in some places, had been bent to the ground. Still they cut and bound and hauled, pausing only for gulps of icy water as the sun sank lower in the sky. After showering and carefully bandaging his numb hands, Rollins nearly nodded off into his supper and didn't budge until eight the next morning when Cal was at their door ready for another day's work. By day three, Rollins could hardly move to get out of bed, but slowly, as the week progressed, his sore muscles became more accustomed to the back-breaking labor and his blistered hands began to callous. On day five, Cal handed Rollins $100 and said he was hired for the weekends. Next chapter, chapter seven, doing hard things. You guys have an awesome day. And remember, we all have a story. Bless you.